Well, every time you turn on the news, it seems, there are more stories about campus intolerance. Progressive faculty and students are shutting down debate, censoring speech, threatening violence against conservative speakers and voices. Joining me now is someone making a real difference on college campuses. Ryan Fournier, political science major at Campbell University and chairman of Students for Trump. Ryan, tell us a little bit about your organization and what you've been able to do on campuses all across the country. Of course, and thank you for having me on. Um, so Students for Trump was founded as a small uh, Twitter account in 2015 um, after I realized I loved Donald Trump and what he was saying. Wasn't speaking like a politician. Um, blunt to the point, was talking about things that weren't being discussed. And I said, you know, I, I want to support this guy. I want to see more of him. And so got out there, made this account. Um, within a month, about 15,000 followers came ringing in. Um, campaign of each eventually reached out, wanted to work with us closely. Um, so we coordinated with them and we, we grew this movement to what it is today and what it you know, was throughout, throughout the election to help get uh, Donald Trump elected. Um, it was a large student movement. Uh, very much so based on the ground and online. Uh, we had a very large social media presence and still do. Hundreds of thousands of followers, millions of views every month. Um, we basically used President Trump's brand uh, and got millennials involved. They loved what they were seeing. They loved the Make America Great Again brand. It was patriotic and they, they loved the, the revamping of American spirit. Um, and this was something that we were very passionate about and many other young people around the country were as well. That's a great story. Now, you say the Trump administration actually reached out for you. Did you get to sit down with Donald Trump personally? And if so, how did that go? On a couple different occasions, I was able to sit down with him. Uh, the first one was in Florence, South Carolina. It was actually the first time when I met him. And it was before a rally. Um, he pulled us into the back room. I guess it's the green room where uh, Lieutenant Governor, then Lieutenant Governor Henry McMaster uh, was in there meeting with him. And he actually held the rally for about seven minutes. Um, past its start time, just to talk to myself and my vice chair, John Lambert, um, about the student uh, numbers and you know how he was polling in, in the different states. Um, and one interesting thing that he said to us was, you know, he was asking us, he said, you know, how do you think I'm going to do in South Carolina? Um, and then he talked a little bit about, we told him we were from North Carolina, talked a little bit about his golf courses there, how he loves the weather, um, just a little bit of small talk, but things that I pulled away from it, he's a very humble, uh, you know, individual. Um, you know, he can command a room of attention. You know, people see him on stage, they see a different Donald Trump than you do when you're in person with him, when you shake his hand and you talk to him. Um, he's very kind hearted, uh, but he knows when to put his foot down when the time is right. And that's something that we need in a leader. And that's what I saw in him in those, you know, 10 minutes that I was in the room with him just talking to him. Um, so it was, a, it was a great honor. And the other different occasions were uh, meetings where, you know, we went over student numbers, which happened about two or three times prior. But I saw the same interaction and the same Donald Trump, um, you know, then that I, that I did the first time. He's a very genuine guy. And it was it was an honor getting him elected. And you are very instrumental in, in mobilizing a demographic that ordinarily we don't associate with Republicans and certainly not with somebody like Donald Trump. And that's what I wanted to ask you about next. Uh, millennials get a bad rap. I mean, there's a lot of easy jokes uh, made at the expense of millennials. They've grown, up, they've grown up in a culture where they have been a little bit more sheltered in some ways. But I wanted to ask you about that. Um, uh, it is amazing to see that many millennial kids and how you've been able to mobilize them. What allows you to get through to these millennial kids, many of whom are college kids, uh, with a, with a non-progressive message when they're so bombarded with left-wing politics, almost exclusively at, at places like university campuses? You know, what I always tell young people is get out there and, and get informed. You know, learn on your own. Don't just, you know, let your parents influence you or let people, your friends influence you. Learn stuff on your own. I mean, it's your civic duty to be informed and to vote. And to see young people like the ones that we worked with during the campaign getting out there and being involved and, and tabling and door knocking and passing out gear, uh, registering people to vote was inspiring to many. And I think that it was just a chain reaction. It was a domino effect. People saw uh, some individuals doing it, their friends doing it, and they wanted to get involved. And it was happening left and right. Um, and it was very fortunate to, to see this on college campus, especially even the you know, furthest of left, UC Berkeley. We had great presence at UC Berkeley. We had great presence at uh, Penn State. Uh, you know, even go all the way down south. I mean, it's expected, but we had great presence at FSU, LSU. Um, and, it, and, it was, and it was really the, the brand behind President Trump. You know, he created the Make America Great Again brand. He acknowledged, as well as many other Americans did over the years, that there was issues in this country that millennials were going to have to handle in the future, 
that you know the current baby boomers are handling now while serving in legislature. Um, these are issues that aren't going to go away overnight. And it's going to be our generation that takes office and has to fix them. So to have the help of President Trump at least ease that burden that's going to be placed on us when we're in public office um, was very instrumental. And so we knew that this guy uh, and all of what he was saying, and, and I, I don't know if you saw today, but he, uh, the Heritage Foundation just rated, said he completed 67% of what he promised to do, uh, more so than uh, President Reagan did during his first year. Um, so it's absolutely amazing to see the progress that's been made. And I think that in itself motivated young people, how he, you know, the things he was saying, the promises he was making, very viable. And to see now that it's getting delivered um, is going to be even more instrumental in getting him reelected. Um, and also, of course, the greater, the greater scheme of things, making America great again, getting our country back on track, bringing jobs back, making sure that trade is going well, making sure that we're not getting the end of the deal like we did under President Obama. Um, so there's a lot of things out there that's going on right now that President Trump's taken the lead on, and we've seen great progress. And beyond that, he's at 50 percent approval rating, which is seven points higher than Obama was at this point in his first term. You wouldn't know it from watching the mainstream media, though. You just touched on something else that I think is really important. And I want you to expand upon that a little bit. When you're selling Donald Trump to a skeptical millennial, somebody your age or a little bit older, younger, when you're trying to convey why Trump is the candidate for the young, uh, what kind of po- what things do you point out? You mentioned some issues that are dear to the hearts of millennials. What in what ways can Trump Trump address issues primarily? Primarily important to this younger generation that's rising. Well, we, we see with Betsy DeVos, uh, you know, she's working on uh, you know, working with loan credits. You know, we're working to make sure that students, uh, when they get out of college, they're not going to be swamped to the point where they can't even afford to buy a house. They're going to have to live with their parents for a couple of years. You know, I, I know people that live with their parents for about five to ten years because they just can't afford to move out on their own because the loans are just incredibly outrageous. Um, you know, the prices of university. Um, And it also doesn't help the fact that, you know, at universities, you see primarily, um, you know, loans being given out um, to students based on color. It's not even at the fact where if you, you know, let's say for me, me being a white Caucasian, having the same GPA as an Asian student, same clubs and all, being involved the same amount, I'm most likely not going to get the scholarship because she is of a minority descent. Um, And that's unfortunate, but that's what we're seeing on college campuses. We're seeing that all across the country. People think it's outrageous to hear, but it's actually happening. And we're seeing it day in and day out um, at universities. And of course, they're not admitting to it, but they do accept quite more minority students than they do of any other uh, color. And that's that is the issue in itself is that we are not being uh, equal. You know, everybody talks about equal rights, equal protection, but it's it's a double sided sword and they're being hypocrites about it. And, you know, the way that we move forward as a country is we just learn to accept everybody, Um, you know, no matter what their color is, Um, you know, no matter what race, gender, what have you. But, you know, he has done a lot so far to ensure that moving forward, especially with Secretary DeVos, that, you know, schools, protecting schools, we're talking about the gun control issue where, you know, it, it is an issue. There needs to be more background check. There needs to be protection of schools. Arming teachers is not a bad idea. It's a great start to the discussion. Now, will it happen right away? Probably not. But it's a great start to a discussion that needs to happen in this country. Um, But, you know, I think I saw more millennials motivated by issues that don't directly affect them yet than issues that are affecting them now, especially in terms of immigration. Um, A lot of a lot of millennials, especially on college campuses, were really toned up about immigration, economic policy, a big one. A lot of the, the trust majors, a lot of the business majors, econ majors. We're all behind us, and we had quite a few on our team, one in our nationals team, actually, um, that were really behind him because of his economic policy and what he was talking about, what he wanted to do with taxes, you know, cutting the tax bracket down. Um, You know, these things have motivated students, and that's where we keep seeing them come back time and time again, you know, asking to keep, you know, continually be involved because they love him. They love what he's doing. The tax bill was a great success. You know, now we got to move on to health care at some point. But, you know, it's been a great first year. You know, it really has. And it's been much better for, for younger generations than a lot of them recognize. You, you, you're a college student. I've, I've been a university professor for 25 years. You touched on some of the major problems we have here. Uh, talk a little bit about your campus, your experience as a conservative on campus. You are a, a very high profile conservative voice. You've made yourself into one. And congratulations. We need more like you. But what does that translate for you in your classes? Uh, have you gotten any blowback on the college campuses? Is your university giving you any problems? Uh, how do you relate in, in an environment that 
that is so radically progressive with with not just conservative views. A lot of kids have those, but the courage and the articulation to go out and make those views impact other people's lives. Well, every college campus is different. And that's something that, you know, we've accepted as, as you know, leaders in the, the young millennial conservative movement. You're going to see a lot of different people at UC Berkeley than you see at, you know, Alabama State or Ole Miss. Um, it's just, you know, the way of life and how things are. Now, liberal bias on college campuses seems to be affecting everywhere, even at my university, Campbell University in North Carolina. Uh, you know, we see a little bit of it, especially with professors. Um, and that's something we fight back against every single day. Now, I know when I traveled across the country and I went to UC Berkeley, when Trump had his rally near there, um, you know, the reaction from protesters really showed how the left loves to act um, politically. You know, it's, it's not even politics at that point. They throw stuff at you. They call you names. They chase you down. They steal your, your MAGA hats. We saw plenty of that, especially the poor woman. I'm sure we all saw the footage where she got egged in the face um, while she's standing outside being surrounded by uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter members, protesters in general. Um, and it's upsetting. It really upsets me that we have went from um, being able to have good, healthy political discourse to my opinion's right, you're automatically wrong. I don't see where that benefits anybody. I don't see where debate and discussion doesn't help anything because it does. When you talk about your problems, instead of holding them inside and getting mad when someone asks you about it, you have a much healthier income or a much healthier outcome. I'm sure you've seen that as a professor as well, is that you, know, you want your students to talk to you if they have an issue. Um, but that's not what we're seeing um, on college campuses. We're seeing silencing. We're seeing uh, you know, grades being changed. We're seeing students being kicked out of classes because their opinions. We're seeing at San Diego State, they're offering a required course um, called something along the lines of Trump impeachment, conviction, or resignation. And I just posted that on my Twitter yesterday. Um, but yet we're seeing all this stuff. And it's, it's more so um, out there now than it was, you know, 10 years ago. I mean, whatever happened in respecting the office of the president of the United States, you know, you may not like the individual, but they've just took it to a whole new level. Um, and it's always fun to pick at, but it's also a serious issue because, you know, this is the start of it here. You know, we might have saw small segments of it 15, 20, 30 years ago, what have you. But now we're starting to see much more evolution to this idea of, you know, not being able to debate, you know, having safe spaces, cry-ins, you know, not wanting your feelings hurt because your views differ from somebody else's. Um, we're seeing so much more of this. Uh, and, you know, Ben Shapiro is a great point. I love the guy. Facts don't care about your feelings, um, quite frankly. And to see that when I give someone a fact and then in response, I get an opinionated response from them where they're yelling and arguing at me, it's, it's basically irrelevant. I don't want to hear that. That's not going to solve anything. But that's what we're hearing more, more of these days. You know, we're not getting facts. We're not having debate and discussion anymore. The only time I see debate and discussion is when I go watch conservatives talk or I go, you know, go to CPAC or something and I see them on the stage and they have a panel. Or, you know, you go to some college clubs and you see debate and discussion. But what you're seeing on television, what you're seeing on CNN, what you're seeing on MSNBC um, is not debate and discussion. Even some Fox people do it. Um, you know, it, it's just rallying. It's, it's rally cries, and it's, 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 it's not helpful, especially in the media. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it's affecting millennials as well because they're the ones going out there. They're the ones going to be looking for jobs. They're the ones that are affected by all this stuff. You know, the lack of, of continuity um, in the debate and discussion process is, is alarming. And it's, it's definitely affecting a lot of young people because they're learning from it. They're taking from it. Some people are learning those methods and going off and doing it on their own. Um, and it's not healthy at all. And we've seen it on college campus after college campus after college campus. On my campus, not so much. I have more establishment-based Republicans. Every now and then I get a comment. But it's not as bad as if you were to go to Washington State University where you literally have people attacking you. Um, or if you go to UC Berkeley, you know, the West Coast in itself is, is fun in terms of college campuses. But you're not going to really see that uh, my campus or a lot more southern or southeast-based SEC schools in specific. You're not going to see that. So uh, you might see a little bit, but not, not as much as you'd see on the West Coast. 
Well, you know, you make a really great point there. And uh, one of the things I always uh, see as a university professor, I, you know, that when there are conservative professors or professors who are not just reflexively liberals, kids come out of the woodwork. I'm amazed at how many liberal kids will take my classes and they'll tell me, you know, I don't agree with everything or even most of what you say, but it is really refreshing to hear the other side for a change. Uh, do, you, do you have the same sense I do from the professoriate I see it? As a student, do you see it? That there really are, there's a quiet, quiet, mini majority, let's call it, of conservative kids out there who don't feel like they can speak out, who, don't, who, don't, who aren't necessarily activists, but they're there and that that's a, a, a real important demographic that we have to tap into more. We're seeing a lot of it. More, and especially the point that you just made, we're seeing it where conservatives on college campuses um, you know, they are afraid to speak out. They come to places like Twitter. You know, they use pseudonyms. They, they speak out there. They go on Facebook. But that's not, that's not enough. That's good. That's a good start, but it's not enough. We need to bring this debate and discussion to lectures on campus, to panels on campus, do stuff in your communities. I tell millennials all the time the best way to get involved is to actually get involved. Don't say you're going to get involved. Don't do it. Don't just go on Twitter and do something. Go out there in your community and make a change. Um, you know, I love it when a college professor expresses a different point of view, expresses a political point of view, as long as they aren't attacking students for their point of view, as long as students aren't attacking the professor for their point of view. That's, that's kind of the agreement that has to be made between both parties. That kind of debate and discussion uh, is very healthy. You need to have that kind of debate and discussion in a classroom because these are um, the centers and bastions for learning and expanding your knowledge, and learning other opinions and ideals, and accepting them. Now, you can decide to um, listen to them, or you can decide to walk away and not care. You know, those are two things. But you should not, at ever point, any point in time, try to attack that person, uh, try to make it where they can't assemble. Uh, all the tactics that we've been seeing, you know, Antifa goes into meetings, they'll stop a meeting, they'll pull the microphone away from the person. That, you know, that, that goes against everything we as a nation fought for and stand by. Uh, goes against our constitutional rights, and for them to do that, uh, it's it's anarchy in a way. And I and I'd go as far to even say that. So I, I definitely welcome uh, millennials to go out there, talk to their professors, create that discussion. Professors go out there, engage with your students, and have a discussion that's meaningful, something that you can both learn something from. Because if you're not doing that, what are we really doing in a college? I mean, besides just, you know, grading papers and, you know, having assignments, what are we really doing? You're going there to learn. You're there to learn other views. You can decide to take them home and, and follow them or believe them or create your own. But don't attack them. Don't go out there and, you know, stop somebody's platform or go out there and, you know, make them not be able to, you know, speak their mind. Because that's what the United States of America is about. Freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And we, we can't allow, um, you know that to happen in this country where, you know, people aren't allowed to do that. And Ryan, I know you just got, you mentioned a moment ago, CPAC. You were just at CPAC. Uh, uh, did you make a, a lot of good connections? Tell us a little bit about your experience there in that rarefied air of the CPAC. Oh, of course. You know, CPAC is, is always a great time. It's always great to catch up with friends, uh, meet new people, networking. Um, you know, I saw Tommy Loran talk to her for a little bit there. I um, even snapped a photo, but we're going to hopefully do some Fox News shoots in the future. But yeah, it's always a great time to, uh, you know, network and, and to hear the other speakers and their points of view. And, and especially the side panels, the discussions and you know, everything in the great. They have a couple different things they do there. They have the main sessions, which is the general session in the big room. And then they have the breakout sessions. And the breakout sessions are always great because they cover areas that are very specific. So if you want to learn how to do social media targeting, this is the place to be. If you want to learn how to combat uh, liberalism on college campuses and be effective at it, this is the place to be. It's a great place to learn how to be an activist and to get out in your community and be effective. And this is one of the things I love about CPAC because as opposed to seeing just older individuals there, I think I see more millennials than older individuals, even in the media side of things. It's all young people. And that is, you know, Democrats don't have something like that. We are revolutionizing the Republican Party, and CPAC has been, you know, time and time again, showing that it is a big piece to that movement, especially with Turning Point USA, college Republicans. We have some very large student groups that are very involved, very active, and have been making an impact each and every day on college campuses. Ryan, before we go, let the people know where they can reach you. How, how can they become part of your movement and help support you? 
Of course, yeah. Um, well, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and you can look up, I'm sure my username's on screen here, uh, Ryan A. Fournier, F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R. It's a weird French, but yeah, it's right there on screen for you guys. I have a website. Please do check me out, and if you need anything, my email's there, and you re reach out to me.